The U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Well, good afternoon and welcome to our seventh Issues in National Security lecture series being held here in the virtual world. I'm John Jackson, and it's my pleasure to be the host for today's event. To kick us off, I'd like to uh, call on Admiral uh, Chatfield to offer her greetings. Admiral? Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. This is part of a community of scholarship that really inspires my husband, David, and I. And don't be surprised if you see him before the end of the night, he's on his way over. And uh, so we are looking forward to the topic tonight and to hearing Professor Schultz. Uh, and so um, thank you so much for being here with us. And over to you, John Jackson and Professor Schultz. Thank you very much, Admiral. Uh, this series was originally established as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. Over the past four years, it has been restructured to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family to include members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport, and participants from around the nation. We will be offering 11 additional lectures between now and May of 2021. An announcement detailing the dates, topics, and speakers of each lecture will be posted by our Public Affairs Office. Looking ahead, on Tuesday, 8 December, I will deliver a lively discussion on drones that fly, swim, and crawl. Please note that my lecture will take place one week from today and that it will be the last lecture until 12 January 2020. Okay, on to the main event. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature of Zoom, and we will get to them at the conclusion of the presentation. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker, Tim Schultz, the U.S. Naval War College Associate Dean of Academics. Prior to joining the Newport faculty in 2012, he served as the Dean of the U.S. Air Force's School of Advanced Air and Space Studies. Tim earned his PhD in the history of technology from Duke University and his research interest in the interaction between technology, strategy, and the transformative role of automation in warfare. He is the author of The Problem with Pilots, How Physicians, Engineers, and Air Power Enthusiasts Redefine Flight from Johns Hopkins University Press, and is co-editor of Air Power in the Age of Primacy, Air Warfare Since the Cold War, which will be published next year by Cambridge University Press. Tim is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy and the Colorado State University, the Air Command and Staff College, and the School of Advanced Air and Space Studies. Formerly a U.S. Air Force Colonel, he spent much of his aviation career as a U-2 pilot, enjoying the view over interesting regions of the globe. I am pleased to pass the digital baton to one of the college's brightest and best scholars, a true friend and colleague, Professor Tim Schultz. Hey, thank you, John Jackson. And thank you, Admiral Chatfield for setting this whole enterprise up and, and hosting it. And it's such a pleasure for me to play a role uh, this, this early evening with you, this first day of December. So welcome everybody. Uh, today's topic is gonna be both backward looking and forward looking. I'll use some historical perspective and also uh, try to look, uh, look ahead to our, our shared future. And kind of my overall position right now is that Naval War College graduates, they think and they lead and they fight at the frontiers, and they always have. The frontiers of sea and air, the frontier of new knowledge, the frontier between science and fiction, the frontier between technological possibility and ethical constraints and political realities, the increasingly contested frontier between machine control and human control. And in some ways, this is terra incognita, unknown territory. 
So for this session, I'm going to examine this frontier of humans versus machines. And I'm going to look at it through a, uh, a number of different angles. And I'm going to let me start sharing some, some slides and images here with you to do that. If you'll just give me a moment. Okay, so I'm going to look at this human versus machines or this human machine relationship in, uh, in several ways uh, th this evening. And we'll use these four kind of ideas, uh, uh, the, the frameworks to approach the issue, uh, various examples of the fusion of human and machine activity. Sometimes it's a literal fusion. Uh, some of the fears associated with machines out of control and some of the, uh, the opportunities and the challenges associated with, with these emerging frontiers. But first, what, you know, what, what's going on with this picture? As you can see, this is not your normal, typical everyday fist bump. It's something a little bit different. It's a little special for a lot of reasons. Here's whose fists are being bumped. It's the president of the United States back in 2016 and he's fist bumping with a gentleman named Nathan. Nathan, you can see him there sitting in his wheelchair on the right, he's paralyzed from the neck down, but he's controlling this prosthetic robotic arm uh, with an interface that's implanted in, in the top of his, his skull. Uh, but he's, he's, so he's controlling it with actual, his mind. He's con this is thought controlled robotics. So the goal, years later, it's not to make this a, just to make this a wireless machine interface, but just to make it better and, and more reactive and more capable. And I'll show you images later of how that is becoming possible. But wireless or not, this allows Nathan to move this robotic arm just by thinking about it. And he can sense what it is touching as well. So he is embodying himself in this machine uh, and so just imagine what he might be able to do in the future. I mean, he could become a surgeon possibly, and a little more on, on how that could feasibly take place uh, here a little, bit, uh, a little bit later. So a lot of wonderful things uh, going on in this image. This new relationship with technology, with the machine, is expanding Nathan's universe of possibilities. But before we spend a little more time on Nathan and new technologies of thought-controlled machines, I wanna provide some frameworks to consider this changing relationship between human and machine. So let me, let me transition to that now. Uh, the first rule about the future is we've been there before. We can recognize ourselves in the past. History tells us that human nature doesn't seem to change that much over time. As a matter of fact, I argue that people change throughout history only in their costume only in what they wear. And, and there is uh, plenty of evidence of that. And I'll, let me give you some of that evidence. This is an image from the Wayback Machine taken in 1839, shortly after photography was developed. And this gentleman is an amateur photographer, a chemist. And what did he do with his, his brand new uh, invented camera? He took a selfie. We've been taking selfies since 1839. Peter Singer says that the average millennial will take 26,000 selfies in his or her lifetime. This is the first selfie. So we can't resist. And not long after uh, uh, photography became increasingly more capable and the movie camera was developed. And what did we make the first movie of? We made a cat video. This is uh, from 1894. It's called The Boxing Cats. And it was filmed by Thomas Edison himself we haven't changed in terms of our nature and our personalities. Here's an image from 1906. It's a cartoon. It's one of my favorite examples of the constancy of human nature. And you may not be able to read the caption I'll, at the bottom. I'll read it, it for you. It says, these two figures are not communicating with one another. The lady is receiving an amatory message and the gentleman some racing results with, by these, with these devices that are sitting in their laps. You see this now a century later at your dinner table every night. Uh, 
human nature doesn't change very much. And this also applies, I would add, to the profession of arms. Here's what some military leaders thought about the advent of steam power. They feared it. They clung to tradition. They, it would turned out to be clearly the wrong approach. You can see what the, uh, the, the, admiral, the admirals were thinking. Uh, they were afraid of steam. They considered the introduction of steam as calculated to strike a fatal blow at the naval supremacy of the empire. So we have a tradition of causing change, but also fearing and resisting change. And here's another example from an, another naval example, British Navy. Uh, this is from 1901, shortly after the advent of submarines. Uh, and one admiral declared that they are underhand, unfair, and damned un-English. So again, this fear and resistance to change is, is somewhat of a constant. But let me provide some evidence also of how we've gone through periods of rapid change in the past. We feel like we're in one now. We are in one now. But we're not strangers to it. We've experienced this before. Just consider the 10-year period between 1947 and 1957. We had the, the Bell X-1 breaking the sound barrier, something that people didn't think could be done. We have the development of thermonuclear weapons. Uh, and nothing says the status quo changes other than when you're sitting in your uh, pool side in Las Vegas at a hotel in Las Vegas and you look on the horizon and you can see a mushroom cloud boiling upward in the distance. That's a, a, a pretty good symbol of, the, of threatening technology. And here are the means to deliver it. Uh, the development of ICBMs in this time frame, and the development of the first uh, nuclear submarines, uh, in this case, the Nautilus. Uh, people were practicing duck and cover drills uh, in the schools. Uh, the transistor was invented during this time. They've gotten a lot smaller since then. Uh, uh, Sputnik appeared uh, and jolted the status quo. Uh, uh, Watson and Crick uh, uh, decoded or figured out the structure of human DNA, which ushered in the genomics re revolution. All of this in a very short amount of time. So we are no strangers to rapid change. We're used to it. But I would argue to you that something is different now. Something is going on. We are in a, this period of nonlinear growth. And uh, Thomas Friedman, the New York Times columnist, notes that it's, uh, it's caused by a combination of computation and interconnection and innovation. And they're all clashing together to create these new things and these new opportunities. Uh, like this young man and, and his imagination, we all recognize ourselves in him. We still have those same creative impulses, but now our technology captures our imagination differently and lets us see and manipulate the world differently. So let me, uh, let me talk about that a little bit more. Here's just a, a, a basic um, rendition of technological change. And I'm suggesting here that technological capability rapidly increases over time particularly in the last few decades uh, from the, say the 1950s to the modern, uh, the modern era. And it's increasing at, a, at an exponential rate. I mean, this curve describes things like the number of drones in the sky, the number of things and people connected to the internet, the number of people connected wirelessly, the, the, the colonization of the population by smart devices. There are some of you sitting out there right now and you, you are wearing a Fitbit, you have a smartphone in your pocket, you're obviously looking at, an, at a, a laptop or a desktop, you're virtually bristling with computational power and it changes your experience of the world. So this curve, it's important because it also highlights a challenge for our Naval War College graduates because there's a super empowerment of not just the state, but the marketplace and the individual. And this is a, this is a strategic problem, but there's something else going on here. How do we humans keep up with this radical technological change? How do we follow this curve? Uh, Thomas Friedman uh, in his uh, book, um, Thank You for Being Late, points out that this curve, it looks like a hockey stick and it reminds him of something that the great Gretzky said, is that I skate to where the, the puck is going to be, not where it has been. How do we skate to where the puck is going? How do we do that as individuals and as an institution? 
we want our graduates of this institution to, to be able to skate to where the puck is going. And part of this means dealing with human capability. And I've indicated here uh, a slightly upward trend in human capability over time, but that may, might be wrong. Uh, it may be just uh, flat. Uh, it may be actually declining. Some of you with a Twitter feed or a teenager may argue that is in fact declining a little bit. But Naval War College graduates need to figure out how to bend this curve of human capability. And that's a large part of what I'll talk about this afternoon. One way to bend the curve is figuring out how to team up humans and create this human machine teaming ability uh, to cultivate this. And this involves various methods of fusing humans and machines together sometimes cooperatively, sometimes literally. So let me turn to that now, the, this, this fusions of humans and machines in this, in, this, in this dynamic relationships. And there are many different ways to team up humans and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll consider now a few different ways. Here's one that doesn't work very well. It's a poor example of human machine integration. This was from the late 1940s when um, the Air Force was trying to figure out if pilots could fly airplanes laying down, not because pilots are lazy, but because you can withstand much higher G-forces in, in a horizontal position than you can when you're sitting in the cockpit. It turned out this was not a good fusion of humans in the machine. It was too awkward, too complicated. But there is a very effective way to fuse or, or pair up humans and machines, and that involves how they share information. And this brings me to this notion of cybernetic theory. And here's an image of the guy who invented it. It's a mathematician named Norbert Wiener. He coined the term cybernetics in 1947. It involves the manipulation of information. And, and Norbert was one of the three titans of the information age in the 1950s, along with people like Alan Turing and John von Neumann. They ushered in an entirely different perspective on how to use information. And Norbert, he opined correctly that if computing capability is good enough, you can create a system with almost any degree of elaborateness of performance. And we certainly see that now with that, that exponential curve. So cybernetics helps bend that curve. And we see it uh, in a lot of different technologies. And the example I'll use is the rapid evolution of human machine teaming in aviation. And I like to talk about this because it's part of my research interest. It gets, gives us a historical perspective that we can apply to modern times as well. So I'm asking here, who are the best pilots? Uh, it is certainly not uh, based on image. It's not the macho ones who look good in pictures, but instead it's the ones who are able to reimagine their roles and adapt their role to new technology. They are the best pilots are the ones who are able to subordinate themselves to superior forms of machine control so they can better take command of the air. This is from the B-17 flight manual in World War II. It said below 10,000 feet, you're a flyer, you're controlling the airplane, stick and rudder skills. Above 10,000 feet though, the mission gets much more complicated, the environment much more dangerous, and you have to integrate yourself in a machine-like way with the overall larger system and machine. You have to become like a machine in order to survive. I'll give you some more examples of that. This is a simple technology here. It's gyroscopically driven. It's an artificial horizon or what aviators call an attitude indicator. Humans cannot fly at night or in bad weather without this device. It keeps them, it prevents them from being disoriented and spiraling into the ground. This technology was developed in the late 1920s and it ushered in this whole new regime of instrument flight. So now pilots could fly in the blind. They could fly at night or in the weather with even these rudimentary crude instruments because they provided uh, this machine information that let them interpret the world differently, not with their own senses anymore, but with information from their machines so they had to insert themselves into this cybernetic information feedback loop in order to survive and really exploit aviation's potential. So it's hugely important to aviation. This is an image from uh, of a device invented in 1933. 
Uh, it's the, the guts of an autopilot, the electronic guts of an autopilot. The New York Times referred to this as the robo pilot. In 1933, it helped a test pilot named Wiley Post fly around the world in seven days, which is impressive in 1933. And he was able to do that because most of the time this robot pilot was in control that expanded his horizons. It helped him do new and different things, kind of like Nathan with his prosthetic arm. It opened up all new types of capabilities. So we see something similar to this with the Norden bomb site in the late 1930s and World War II. Pilots learned that during the bombing run, they needed to turn control over to the autopilot and over to this, this uh, uh, high-tech bomb site because it controlled the aircraft much better than humans could. So the human machine relationship was changing. Here we see uh, an example of the roboticization of bomber aircraft in World War II. This is a remote control hookup in a B-17 bomber so it can be flown uh, unmanned into precision targets in Europe, sort of kamikaze style, except without the, the inconvenient suicide associated with it. And it was used to some uh, modest effect in, uh, in 1944. Here's a comment uh, before the war from the, uh, the leading uh, Air Force general. He recognized that, hey, we need to relegate the human flyer and elevate the mechanical pilot, elevate the machine. And after the war, he observed one year ago, we were guiding bombs by TV controlled by a man remotely in a plane 15 miles away. I think the time is coming when we won't have any men in a bomber. And boy, did that ever turn out to be true as we'll see. Um, this image from just after the Second World War, it shows how, how pilots are fusing into something different. They're becoming electronic. They're becoming increasingly reliant on electronic forms of control. In 1947, a robotic piloted aircraft, uh, which still had a crew of about eight people in it, it flew from Canada to Britain uh, without humans touching the controls at all pretty sophisticated feat of engineering to show the rise of the machine. And we see that in modern times now with this very, very sophisticated, very elaborate cybernetic control system that this predator pilot is now operating. And you can see how the human machine interface has changed and what it now looks like in the modern era, but it's based on our previous experiences. This gentleman is part of that bending of the curve. A few years ago, the chief of staff of the Air Force said that the old way of doing things of one pilot flying just one aircraft was, quote, a Neanderthal way of thinking. And I think he, uh, he's right. Uh, now one pilot can control not just her own aircraft or his own aircraft, but an unmanned wingman or a number of unmanned wingmen like this F-16, this unmanned F-16, that's uh, uh, on the image before you. Uh, I talked earlier about selfies. This is what it looks like when a robot takes a selfie. As you can see, there is no pilot occupying that seat anymore. And a few years ago, the Secretary of the Navy said that the F-35 will almost certainly be the last manned strike fighter the, the Navy will buy or fly. And we'll see if that's true. Elon Musk similarly said, hey, fighter jet era has passed, at least the manned fighter jet era has passed. Now it's drones. And you'll get more from that about this from John Jackson uh, during the next uh, uh, lecture uh, later this month, I'm sure. So, but there are some other fusions, fusions that I wanna talk about um, uh, beyond the history of aviation uh, where human uh, and machine teaming is important. Uh, this was a, a headline from just a few days ago about how the army plans for, for robots to be in their platoons, where there's a drone, every soldier is, has a drone and they're robotic mules, and the soldiers aren't going to necessarily control these robots with uh, keyboard commands or spoken commands, but these robots are gonna rely on emotional cues from the soldiers like facial expressions and signs of stress and body language to aid cooperation actually out in the field. These robots will read their emotions. This is the next stage in that cybernetic feedback mechanism in this human and machine relationship. 
Um, we see this, and this may be in military medicine at some point, uh, robotic surgery. Here's an image of a surgeon. He doesn't have his hands inside the patient. It's the robot has its devices inside the patient. This is called the, 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 the Leonardo da Vinci surgical device, aptly named, I think. But we can do uh, even one better now. Uh, and this happened in 2001, uh, two decades ago. Uh, surgeons in New York removed the gallbladder of a patient in France utilizing telesurgery, this remote controlled robotic surgery. It was called the Lindbergh operation because it went from, from New York to, uh, to France. So we can see this changing relationship. And in November of 2019, uh, Chinese doctors did the first 5G enabled remote brain surgery. So we see this relationship changing and we see it with this notion of cyborgs. We talked about cybernetic theory earlier. Well, a cyborg is just a cybernetic organism. It's an organism that is somehow fused with a machine. And in the modern era, humans are becoming a type of an emerging technology. We are both designers now and the object of design. We are engineers and, the, and products that themselves can be engineered. And this takes us back to Nathan with his robotic mind controlled prosthetic and merging of man and machine uh, uh, in this dynamic relationship between humans and machines. And here's Nathan reaching out uh, uh, where he can sense things that he has not been able to sense uh, organically. And he can, he can tell apart these different objects, uh, even with his eyes closed, he can tell what he's touching. There's a convergence here where there's, there's this emergent uh, 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 ability that Nathan is developing as he's embodying himself in this new machinery. But here's something that might be next for Nathan and, and people like him. Instead of that, that clunky device that's drilled literally in the top of his head, here's something from another one of uh, uh, a modern company, uh, one of uh, Elon Musk's companies called Neuralink. And it's a device that can be implanted uh, in the brain at the top of the skull. Uh, and it can help people control uh, uh, machinery just with their thoughts, with their minds. And this is... Uh, ironically, it's surgically implanted not by a human surgeon, but the Neuralink device is installed by a robotic surgeon, which seems appropriate, and the humans are monitoring it, the process for safety. And there's even an app for that. These people who get these implants, they're going to have an app on their iPhones, and, and they can think uh, through the power of their own thoughts, they'll be able to control their iPhones and the keyboard and mouse and, and whatever else those might be connected to as well. So think what that might mean for people like, like Nathan. He could at perhaps become a, a, a surgeon who does telesurgery robotically and from a great distance, a whole new universe of opportunities. We also see this with cyborgs being genetically engineered to integrate with machines. Here's an example where we did it not with a human, but with an insect. The, uh, this dragonfly, its, its neurons were genetically engineered so they would become light sensitive. And then a little backpack device was put on this insect uh, so it can control the direction of flight by pulses of light. And it has a little solar panel uh, to power this and it carries little sensors. It is a true uh, cyborg. It's this true emergence of a living uh, organism with technology. And you might ask, is this ethical or is it a some sort of a perversion of the natural world. Uh, what you and I think is important, but what your children and your grandchildren think will be increasingly important. And here's another example of a, a literal fusion of an animal and machine, this injection of these special nanoparticles into, into the eyeball of, of a mouse so it could see uh, at night, so it has infrared vision, perhaps come into some special operation forces uh, near you. So let's kind of transition now from some of these examples of different fusions of humans and machines to some of the fears that are associated with this, uh, this phenomenon. So Hollywood does a great job in, in monetizing these fears. Um, you know, there's this idea about out there about our robot overlords. Uh, are they going to unemploy us? Are they going to enslave us? Are they going to eradicate us? You have the, 
the HAL 9000 computer from uh, Stanley Kubrick's uh, uh, film 2001 A Space Odyssey. And of course, you have the Terminator here. Um, we don't know if they're going to eradicate us. We do know at this point that they can and they will beat us in chess and in other games. Gary Kasparov, the great human chess master, learned this the hard way where he lost to an IBM computer in 1997. When that happened, some people predicted that, oh, this is near the end. We're in danger as a species. Machines have surpassed humans. Well, 23 years later, we're still here. We're still doing okay. We've got better at playing chess. I'm going to return to Gary Kasparov uh, later and, and his views on, on the benefits of artificial intelligence. But let me, in terms of the fears though, I'm going to break it down into these topics. This notion of big brother and big other and loss of cognitive control, loss of physical control, and this concept of the singularity. And I'll, I'll, let me address those briefly here. So big brother, Notion's been around uh, since Orwell wrote his book, 1984, in the year 1948. We hear the term Orwellian applied to a lot of today's technological advances. One of those is rooted in an old concept that's called the, the panopticon. Panopticon is just a fancy word for seeing everything, pan optics, to see all, to see everything. It's an old idea. Uh, they used it in prisons. Uh, if you have a guard tower with tinted windows, the guard can see the inmates, but the inmates can't see the guard. So they always have to behave like they're being watched. Big Brother shapes your behavior through this panopticon visual type of effect. Here is a modern panopticon. It shapes behavior. This one is uh, in a Western city we're all familiar with. Here are, is a panopticon set up in uh, Tiananmen Square. Uh, China likes to use these to a significant extent. Uh, but they're used elsewhere here as well. Here's the, uh, here's the uh, Capitol in DC. And here's the New York Police Department's portable panopticon, if you will. Note the tinted windows. It shapes people's behavior. This is, this is big brother. But now we can make it more effective with, uh, with our computation and our technology. And we can also use it to help recognize what's going on. Some panopticons can be worn. Here are two Chinese police officers sporting the latest in panopticon accessories, if you will, but it lets them do facial recognition in real time. That's a pretty powerful policing effect. And in China and just about everywhere else in the world, we are carrying these little panopticons in our pockets called smartphones. They potentially give government uh, the, uh, an idea of who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. And here, Chinese citizens are boasting about their social credit scores reflected on their personal panopticon iPhones. So let me now move from Big Brother, which is a, a government sort of form of power, to Big Other. And this is a term used by Shoshana Zuboff in her book, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, to describe the pervasiveness and the invasiveness of the modern machine age in the marketplace. And this includes the internet of things. All of us are a part now of the internet of things. Uh, our smartphones, our doorbells, our thermostats, our, our ovens, everything electronic in the, phone, in the home now increasingly. We have TVs that hear us, homes that know us, books that read us. You get the picture. Some of you uh, here this evening may have a Nest thermostat in your home. Well, it can observe your pattern of life. Uh, it can learn things about you and alter its behavior based on that. But it's also gaining information about you. This is something a predator drone does over a village. It determines patterns of life. But now the things in your home do that as well. And personally, I think they should redesign the Nest thermostat a little bit to make it look more like what it really is. A little more like HAL 9000, the murderous a supercomputer from Stanley Kubrick's film because HAL 9000 is smarter than us and HAL knows what is best. And your panopticon now can also stare outside your home and various police forces in a growing number of cities are asking for permission to access this imagery from your, your doorbell to make the neighborhood more secure. And it makes sense. 
who wouldn't want to be more secure, but this is part of that internet of things. Here's something that the CEO of Google said, and I think it's important to note that he said it, Eric Schmidt said it two, uh, 10 years ago. And so it's even more relevant now. It's, it's, it's even truer now. You give us more information about you, about your friends. We can improve the quality of our searches. We don't even need you to type. We know where you are. We know where you've been. We can know more or less what you're thinking about. Think about it this way. You are being digitally stopped and frisked constantly, even in your own home. And Big Other is also trying to get you to think about what it wants you to think about and shape your perceptions for the marketplace. So this is one of those downsides of the human machine relationship. Another downside or another fear that's associated with it is this loss of cognitive control. We might be more safer or safer and more efficient in general, but the types of mistakes that we make as we fuse ourselves in these technological systems, they're harder to predict. Um, the famous uh, airline pilot who landed his aircraft on the Hudson, uh, Soli Solenberger, said that new technology changes the nature of the errors that are made. We saw this with the, um, the USS McCain uh, in its tragic accident a few years ago. There was confusion over how to operate the, the steering technology on the McCain. Uh, the, the, the series of errors were connected to that confusion about how to use and interpret some of the ship's technology. So there is some legitimate fear and, con and concern about the, that loss of cognitive control. We saw a loss of cognitive control and a subsequent loss of physical control with the Boeing 737 MAX aircraft where pilots didn't understand what the autopilot was doing and they didn't, couldn't figure out how to fix it and it resulted in uh, a two terrible, uh, a terrible collisions. So some of the downsides of this loss of cognitive control and physical control, we also see a loss of physical control or a concern about it in terms of humans being outside of the loop. And this is one of the main arguments about a, a propaganda campaign, uh, the campaign to stop killer robots uh, and this notion that the uh, the drones are out there and they're not subject to human control uh, and that they're taking over the skies. It, that's very hyperbolic. Uh, the drones that are used by the U.S. military are, are exquisitely and closely manned by human will and human decision. But this recognizes the potential for this type of development. And, it, and, and I, an interesting connection is just last week, uh, there was an assassination in Iran of a top Iranian nuclear scientist. And the conjecture now is he was assassinated with the use of a remote controlled device, remote controlled machine gun. Um, more, more, I'm sure, will develop on that. Another fear associated with the human and machine relationship, or maybe not a fear, but a hope for some people, is this convergence of human and machine into what some call this the singularity. And it says here in the small print on the cover of Time Magazine, if you believe humans and machines will become one, welcome to the singularity movement. This is the notion that machines will soon surpass and usurp human capabilities uh, to the point where humans will have to download their consciousness, their neural network into an immortalized digital form. At least that is the hope that they will be able to do this. Some people think this, given the rate of technological change, that this will absolutely happen by around 2045. They think it's inevitable. I'm always wary of arguments about inevitability. I think this is more of a myth of the future, a myth of a possible future. It sounds to me more like a techno-mystical ideation of the future, but it has something that a lot of people express concern uh, about. And this brings us to the idea of the notion of frontiers. And this is the fourth major segment I'll, I'll talk about uh, uh, this evening uh, in terms of this human machine relationship and the frontiers uh, that are involved with it. We've already talked about some of them, but let me be um, a little more um, explicit. Uh, here's an example from the Navy. We're in a age of cognitive computing decision and cognitive assistance, machine assistance to help us all make sense 
of this data, this immense amount of data, and this is a of a uh, 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 the, uh, the sea hunter, uh, an unmanned uh, uh, a naval uh, vessel developed recently. Um, it brings me to the notion, this frontier really of cognification. Uh, think about it this way. Well, I'll compare it to cognification to electrification. Electrification gave us a new form of, of power. It let people heat their food and cool their drinks and operate their machinery and watch Game of Thrones and all of these good things Do it just by plugging something into a power outlet. But now instead of plugging into an outlet, we can plug into the cloud and open up all sorts of different possibilities. We have access to these forms of cognification, things, these forms of intelligence, artificial intelligence that do some of our thinking for us. They interpret the world for us. They let us focus on different, more creative things. When you first drove to Newport, when you were assigned to the Naval War College, none of us looked at a physical paper map. We looked on our smartphones or used ways to help us drive here. That's cognification. It's this outsourcing, it's this, it's this help from the, from the modern world of computing. And we see that with Amazon and Fitbit and Facebook and Uber and all the rest of it. Uh, so instead of worrying ab about artificial intelligence enslaving or eradicating us, we need to think more about what we will do with artificial intelligence and what it might help do for us. It also is involved in cognifying warfare. So cognification implies to war as well. How might future warfare be cognified by intelligent machines? And what does this mean for the role of humans? What does this mean for the role of leaders in Naval War College graduates? It brings up the question, is it okay to be killed by a machine process in which a human is separate from the decision or didn't make the decision? What does, is that an affront against human rights and human dignity? That's a question that, that many people are starting to consider. Here's a more immediate example of the cognification of warfare, and it's this notion of algorithmic warfare. Uh, a recent Secretary of Defense, Bob Work, argued that the future of warfare relies on actionable intelligence and insights at speed. And when he says that, he means machine speed, computer speed, not the slow, slow speed of human thinking, but the much faster speed of machine intelligence. And this applies not just for war, but perhaps uh, uh, law enforcement and other walks of life as well. Let me go back to aviation here for a second. There's an old time pilot there on the left and a newer one on the right. We've gone from pilots relying on their basic senses and sensibilities to pilots who now rely on computer generated imagery of the world, this cognified view of the world. And this F-35 test pilot says, you can look through the jet's eyeballs to see the world as the jet sees the world because the jet's view of the world is put on his visor. So he interprets the world through what the jet sees. He says it's like wearing a laptop helmet, a laptop on your head. This is cognification. This is a fusion of human and machine. And it's evidence that human organic vision, that's becoming kind of a, you know, that's a 20th century thing. Now, in warfare at least, we need machine vision. So this pilot is still an important part of the system, but not because of his physical skill. He's important because he's learning how to become a manager of systems and he's freeing himself up or herself to see things more holistically and creatively and exploring new frontiers in the command of the air. So we fought robots in the air before. Here's an image from 1944. This is a British Royal Air Force Spitfire uh, taking out a, a German robotic drone, a V1 drone. Uh, it uh, basically comes up next to the drone and flips the wing and it tumbles the drone's gyro and the drone then spiraled into the English Channel. But this was a fight against an unthinking drone, an unthinking robot. What if the robot thinks and acts faster than its human adversary? Well, we have that now. Just recently, a couple of months ago, artificial intelligence easily 
be it dominated a human fighter pilot in a, uh, a trial put forth by the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency and also uh, uh, done in concert with Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. And in this experiment, the artificial pilot won uh, five to nothing. Uh, it, it, it beat the human pilot uh, every time. The score was 5-0. If this was combat, the artificial pilot would have been decreed an ace. So in the future, would you even know if you are fighting a human or an artificial intelligence? And this brings us to Alan Turing's notion of the imitation game, something he uh, coined way back in the 1950s. Can artificial intelligence convincingly mimic human behavior? Here's a brief paragraph on this topic, um, and it's pretty insightful. It says, artificial intelligence programs lack consciousness and self-awareness. They will never be able to have a sense of humor. They'll never be able to appreciate art or beauty or love, never feel lonely, never have empathy uh, for the animals or for your environment. They'll never enjoy music. They'll never fall in love or cry at the drop of the hat. I, I, it makes you wonder who wrote this because it seems pretty insightful. Well, as it turns out, this wasn't written by a human. It was written by an artificial intelligence program called GPT-3. The GPT-3 program was fed a prompt of say a few words or write a few words expressing skepticism about AI. And here's what the AI came up with. It mimicked human intelligence to an astonishing degree. Here's some pictures or images of humans, another form of mimicry, because none of these are real people. They're all AI generated images, and you're seeing this used more and more in commerce because you don't have to pay these models and actors. Uh, you can just create them with AI. Uh, we'll see where this might go in the future. Um, in terms of uh, uh, connecting to the past, we've all heard the term sea change before, and it comes from uh, a line in Shakespeare from uh, uh, the play, The Tempest, and you can see it here in the last two lines, we talks about uh, suffering a sea change, becoming something rich and strange. Is the human machine relationship undergoing a sea change? Are machines becoming something rich and strange? And are they making us humans become something rich and strange? We see this with these uh, implanted devices uh, in people who have lost their own organic physical control of their limbs. Uh, and we see how that's advanced into uh, these wireless devices there in the bottom right, that, uh, that new Neuralink device. Well, where does this lead? Will we become more like cyborgs? Will we be changing ourselves significantly in the future? Will this be happening to our children, or our grandchildren? Will they be becoming something rich and strange? Will these enhancements, though, might they just feel like amputations? Would they be something less than human? Or will they make us more creative and thus make us feel even more human? We'll see. One of the key questions here for Naval War College graduates in this new frontier is, will ethics keep pace? You know, so there's a pacing problem at play here, where technological change outpaces changes in laws and social values and ethics, that's always the case. It's a fundamental leadership challenge. And in the classic Naval War College tra tradition of answering a hard question with posing other additional questions, let me provide these questions. These are three classic questions. I didn't make them up. These are from Immanuel Kant from the 18th century. What can we know? What should we do? What may we hope? These are good questions for us to ask and for our graduates to ask. I would suggest to you that as machines learn, humans must unlearn. Humans must think differently, challenge assumptions, challenge the status quo. And as machines operate and where machines operate, humans must orchestrate. And while machines imitate, humans must create. And while machines think in artificial ways, humans must think and act in ethical ways. That is the challenge for us. That is what we must hope. Going back to Gary Kasparov briefly here in, in the last couple of minutes, uh, as it turns out, being beaten by a computer was a good thing for him. It made him more creative. It made him a better thinker, not just a better 
chess player because it made him focus on what makes us human, our minds. So that is something to consider as we walk backward into, into this future. And I always like to share this, uh, this Lincoln quote with new groups of, uh, of incoming students, this notion that he expressed in 1862 that we must think anew and act anew. And that still applies to us here at the Naval War College, uh, most certainly. So a few decades ago, a, a novelist and a scientist named Charles Snow, he wrote that scientists must have the future in their bones. Well, I would argue to you that Naval War College graduates, they must also have the future in their bones and they must have the future in their minds because this, I've, I think I've, I've tried to describe the frontier that they're going to face. It is wild, it's unpredictable, it's dangerous, it's exhilarating, it's promising, it is there for the creating and for the leading. So what can we hope? Well, the real problem is not whether machines think, but whether men do. So we can hope that we can all learn to think adaptively and think differently. Machines are learning how to think differently, but will we learn how to think differently? We know that Naval War College graduates must be skilled and learn how to think differently. So this brings us back to the beginning, the story of, of technology, the story of conflict, the story of peace, the story of the future. All of these in the end are not a story of machines, but they're stories of humans. This is a human story. And it is a story that our graduates will write. Okay, thank you for your attention. Uh, and now, uh, I'll turn it back over to you. I think we have uh, a few minutes here for, um, uh, for some Q&A. So uh, uh, over to you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, uh, Robbie the robot and I are going to pass along a few questions that we've gotten from our, uh, our listeners and whatnot. So Robbie, you stand by and let the human do it for a little while. So uh, as always, we've got uh, a number of uh, uh, very, very interesting questions. Uh, I'll jump to one of them, and that's basically, based on what you've said, might we need to put limits on what an artificial intelligence can do, and is it potential that the AI will prevent us from doing that? So it comes back to the who's going to be in control, man or machine question. Yeah, a fundamentally important question. Uh, there is a lot of talk about limits on uh, how we develop and train AI uh, for ethical reasons. Um, we don't want uh, increasingly artificial machines to reflect our flaws, uh, our human flaws, and those are many. Um, so how do we get to them to reflect our values and our ethics that are universally accepted? Um, can you put uh, guardrails on that? Um, I think it's very difficult. Uh, I think it will it will be giving lip service to that, but will it actually be happening? Uh, I am not so sure. I'm not overly confident about that because machine intelligence is developing at, at such a fast and iterative pace. We lag behind it. It's hard to recognize it and what's going on, even with the way these neural networks work in, in AI. Uh, they come up with solutions where we don't know how they came about these answers. Uh, a friend of mine and I were just sharing some texts and some articles on this new develop, AI development, the ability to, uh, to predict or to solve this super difficult problem in biology of protein folding. Uh, and AI was recently able to, to do that, but it's very difficult to figure out how it did that. So keeping up with AI and corralling it and, and focusing it that is replete with, with many new challenges. Uh, so um, I think the important thing to remember is that we humans are still the ones who create and we fund and we, and we steer research, uh, but we also need to embed in those institutions, government institutions, marketplace institutions, the importance of, of our ethical values and ethical behaviors. We need to be talking about that much more uh, as a society.
And John, I got you on mute there. there well, we that's, that's, that's technology for you. Uh, the Chinese have said they intend to be the world leader in artificial intelligence within the next several decades. Do you believe the United States is doing enough from a uh, national perspective to look into what AI needs to be and how we need to control it and how we need to partner with these systems in the future? I think China right now, in by some measures, is, is eating our lunch in terms of uh, development of AI, the, the amount of funding that's going for it, uh, government funding. Uh, but we, I don't want to dismiss this inherent advantage we have in in a free market here in the U.S. and and with our uh, our Western allies, and in our our free market um, uh, uh, business apparatus, our industries, uh, our universities, uh, and this government, this this troika, this relationship, which is really important. I think more government funding and attention needs to be put towards the development of AI. Um, but the leading edge of it is still occurring at universities in the United States and in Western Europe. And we see uh, companies developing these capabilities that are mostly belong to the US and to Western countries, but that could be a fleeting advantage. Um, China is very serious about this. Uh, the Russians are serious about it, but not as well equipped as the Chinese and, and certainly the West. Um, so I have, I'm of two minds really on China. Yeah, it's a growing problem uh, for that and, and other reasons, but we also have inherent advantages in the United States and in the Western uh, free world that we can take advantage of uh, that, that allows, really uh, accelerates human uh, creativity in a free marketplace. That I think is a powerful advantage. Question, uh, many of these innovations seem to be focused on offensive capabilities. Are we seeing similar increases in the pace of defensive capabilities using such systems? Yeah, I think uh, those two will proceed a, a pace in, in a complementary fashion, just as, as they do in terms of the, the traditional arms races. You're gonna see a, a shifting focus on offense and defense um, something that comes to mind is, is Israel's Iron Dome uh, system. You know, that, that is heavily computerized and it's designed to perform a defensive function against incoming rockets and has had some significant degree of, of, uh, of success. Um, there are, sure, offensive capabilities are going to be pursued. Um, the thing with the defense, though, is you have to be right all of the time or almost all of the time for it to be effective. And if you're just wrong a small amount and a significant weapon gets through, uh, you know, th those those stakes are pretty high. So it is it is difficult to get everything right on the offense. I think that on the defense, the uh, I think the important thing is to be resilient and to be adaptive. And that is an inherent part of the defense. So if something if damage does occur and something does get through, can we adapt uh, to it? Can we be resilient enough to uh, repair and overcome? I think that's something we need to focus more on. And I know in the, in the cyber world, uh, from an unclassified perspective, there are, of course, among different nations, offensive uh, efforts and uh, uh, significant defensive efforts as well. And they the, uh, that relationship between the two would apply in these other forms of emerging technologies. For this next question, you may want to reach behind you and put on your flight jacket because the question is, uh, how do you believe that aviators and pilots are going to transition into a world in which perhaps the machines are the primary pilots? Well, I think to a degree they have. Um, but we're going to, uh, we'll have traditional pilots around for a long time. I don't want to get on an airliner that doesn't have a human at the controls who at least is monitoring what's going on and has the ability to override what's going on. I think that's the same for, for everybody here uh, as well. Um, there is still a significant role for humans in the machine. Um, however, what they do in the machine is different. Now, I'll go back to the F-35. That was designed for air-to-air -air engagements that occur BVR, beyond visual range. 
dozens, scores of miles away, uh, far beyond what the pilot could physically see herself or himself. Uh, so there's a huge reliance on technology. If you're in a close-up dogfight in an F-35 with an opposing aircraft, a MiG or whatever, uh, something's gone wrong. The plan has not gone correctly because that adversary should have been shot down before the pilot ever could lay their their Mark I organic eyeballs on. Uh, but there still is a room for a human in the machine, but their roles will be changing. And sometimes it will be much better to have aircraft that behave like fighters and bombers without uh, pilots in them, as long as there is a human, if not in the machine, at least on the loop uh, that, that controls that machine that will open up uh, different uh, military possibilities uh, and different uh, uh, opportunities to project power. And we've seen that in the last nearly 20 years in terms of drone strikes in any number of nations, that unmanned capability provides a whole new range of military possibilities in terms of, of surgically taking out bad guys, uh, such as the uh, uh, Soleimani back uh, early in the winter, uh, taken out uh, what we think was by a drone strike, uh, and, and a long list of other uh, of, uh, uh, unseemly characters uh, who, are, who pose various threats. So humans will, stay, will play an important role, but increasingly, there will be uh, aircraft that that don't rely on them directly and maybe don't have a human in them and that makes those things more capable i don't want to completely dismiss my brothers and sisters out there who wear wings uh, we are still valued in that degree and i think will be for the indefinite future but we're going to be required to be more creative and think differently uh, and, and evolve ourselves along the way and we're about out of time, Tim. Maybe one final question, and you touched on it a little bit, is what's the proper balance between uh, technical education and the humanities in the professional military environment, professional military education environment? Well, we're mostly a humanities, exclusively a humanities program here, almost exclusively. Um, you, the, the, the STEM aspect, fundamentally important. Uh, we need men and women uh, in uh, the profession of arms and the national security apparatus of our country and our, and our allies who are steeped in science and technology and engineering and, and mathematics, uh, especially in the modern age. But we also must have those same people imbued with a sense of the humanities. As a, as a, a friend of mine, Tom Hughes, emphasizes strategy is a humanity. War is a humanity. It's not humane necessarily, but it is a humanity. It involves politics and economics and, and culture and anthropology and language and all of these things outside of, of the STEM world that our graduates must be well-versed in because we're teaching them not specific ways to think about specific technologies, but how to think about how to adapt technologies to the evolving security environment and to the human condition and how to lead in that environment. And that ultimately is a humanity. And that shows that, that it's so important to integrate those two together. That's what we're about here at the Naval War College. Nicely said, thank you, Tim. Any last comments before we uh, switch back to uh, Admiral Chatfield for her closing remarks? Any last thoughts, Tim? Well, I just want to thank everybody for their attention and for you, John, for uh, uh, for introducing this and, and scheduling it and uh, Admiral Chatfield for orchestrating all of it and making it possible where we can just come together and talk about ideas uh, and, and just try to make each other uh, think better in this dangerous world, yes, but also this one with wonderful opportunities and a future that we can make, and we're going to make it together, and I think we can make a good one. Thank you, sir, very much. Uh, normally, we have a family discussion group meeting, but considering that we're all very, very busy this time of year, we're going to uh, conclude uh, with uh, Admiral Chatfield's remarks. So, Admiral, over to you, ma'am. 
Well, I want to say uh, thank you so much for uh, Professor Schultz, uh, just a really uh, thought provoking lecture this evening. And uh, we're bombarded by these increases in the pace of uh, technological improvements and innovations uh, in all aspects of our life. And it's hard to manage. And I, uh, I love that Freedom Friedman book because it was so, it allowed us to be a little bit gentle with ourselves as uh, each of these technological changes impacts us. And, uh, and as I think toward the future and think, uh, you know, how much has changed already since uh, I entered the Navy 32 years ago, um, I, I think the pace is the biggest change as how quickly things change for our young officers, our mid-grade officers and our senior officers. And uh, your summary uh, to, to really highlight how important it is for leaders to be educated about not just technology, but the ethics of technology, not just about uncertainty, but decision-making amidst uncertainty and not just about leading in times of peace and war, but leading people in this realm of, of uncertainty. Uh, the things that we knew uh, are constantly being re-examined uh, in this uncertainty. Uh, and throughout it all, we have to innovate and integrate across the force, across the joint force uh, with allies and partners. And uh, it's just uh, a lot for a single person and for a single organization. And that's where we need the support and, uh, and being open to getting support uh, in a way that maybe we hadn't in the past through technology uh, will be key in how we all move forward together. So um, I'm just really thrilled that you brought this lecture to this forum uh, and I hope that everybody enjoyed it as much as David and I did. So thank you very much again. And as always, uh, John, what a tremendous job in moderating. And uh, thank you again for being here and a consistent uh, part of this program and all of our folks in support uh, in the background, uh, Gary Ross and all of our uh, events um, and technical personnel. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you very much, Admiral. Our normal battle rhythm is we do these lectures about every two weeks, but we, again, we're changing. So next Tuesday, same place, same time, uh, we'll be talking about drones that fly, swim, and crawl. So thank you very much. We'll see you next week.